Yes, er dere klare for konferanse? Ja, så bra. Det er jeg også. Og da skal vi gjøre en ny øvelse. Vi skal teste engelsken min. Fordi vi skal nå over i første introduksjon av første foredragsholder. It's a pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker today on this conference. Uh, and we will start out in a field that is relevant for a lot of people, uh, but often a, a field that is not taken seriously enough. Tinnitus and hyperacusis. Too many people are told by their GPs that there is nothing to do, but our first keynote speaker says otherwise. Dr. Hashir Ash an audiologist, a specialist in tinnitus and hyperacusis rehabilitation. You have written over 50 scientific papers in the field of audiology. You have developed and managed several tinnitus and hyperacusis services in the UK. And you are also the organizer of the International Conference of Hyperacusis. You have come all the way today to share with us your view on cognitive behavioral therapy delivered by audiologists. Please welcome Dr. Hashir Ash. Well, uh, good morning and thank you very much for uh, the very nice uh, introduction. And um, so th a big thank you to the organizing committee for organizing this fantastic event, and especially to Lynn for uh, thinking of me and inviting me. And, um, and thank you to all of you for you know, being here and uh, listening to this uh, presentation. So the uh, topic of my uh, presentation is audiologists delivered cognitive behavioral therapy for management of tinnitus, hyperacusis, and misophonia. And before I start, uh, by raise of hands, can you please tell me how many of you see patients who have tinnitus? Fantastic, so this is relevant. How about hyperacusis? Mm, fantastic. Misophonia? Well, that's good. It's much more than <laughs> I expected, so this presentation will be uh, relevant to you. And um, so my presentation is more about cognitive behavior therapy for these conditions as opposed to try to describe uh, research evidence uh, for tinnitus and hyperacusis and misophonia. My focus is on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. First, uh, some definitions. So tinnitus is the perception of sound with no acoustic stimulation. So for majority of people who have tinnitus, there is no actual uh, sound or mechanical vibrations in the cochlea which lead to a hearing tinnitus. And uh, so there is no uh, source, uh, identifiable source for that. There are, of course, some people who are in the minority of the tinnitus population which their tinnitus can be related to some sort of internal uh, bodily sounds and they're often called uh, somato sounds like whether it is the arteries in the uh, close to ears or muscles or even the outer hair cells and but majority of the people with tinnitus there is no uh, acoustical or mechanical source for the tinnitus and tinnitus can be in different uh, sounds, whistling, buzzing noise, uh, ringing or a rushing noise or a combination of these noises. Uh, again, majority of people who have tinnitus, this doesn't really impact on their life and it is important for them to see you, do their test and if there is nothing uh, specific or no underlying condition that needs to be treated, they do not need any further help. Uh, but there are some people with tinnitus which tinnitus impacts on their life, impacts on their sleep, uh, relationship, uh, their concentration, so the quality of life will be affected. And those are the people who need uh, your um, uh, support in the way of various forms of therapy, one of which would be cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, hyperacusis is perception of uh, certain everyday sounds, such as domestic noise or noise in public places, as uh, too loud or painful. So a person with hyperacusis, uh, they often complain of uh, loud traffic noise, 
and they find it very hard to go to the street. They have to use earphones and earplugs uh, to cover their ears, otherwise the noises are going to hurt uh, their ears. They find it very hard to, um, to listen to music in the same volume that other people uh, enjoy listening to music. And if they are children, they find it very hard to cope in the school, playground, uh, sport activities, music classes. So this type of noise is very uncomfortable for them to um, tolerate. The third condition is misophonia, is perception of uh, certain sounds produced mainly by humans, uh, such as eating noises, breathing noises, chewing sound, slurping a soup, for example, or swallowing, uh, or breathing noises, heavy breathing. These noises can be, um, they, they perceive these noises as uh, disgusting and, uh, and offensive. And uh, so if a person with misophonia it, it is very hard for them to sit at the dinner table with their family member because they feel disgusted and very angry by the noises of chewing and eating or breathing uh, and this type of noises. So in misophonia, it's not, more, uh, it's not about the, how loud the noises are, but these type of noises create a lot of anxiety and distress in those uh, people. So as you can see, these three conditions uh, can impact on people's life differently, and a person with misophonia, their symptoms would be uh, different to a person with hyperacusis, and, and they will be different from those with, uh, with, with tinnitus. And, but all three conditions can cause significant distress and impairment in, um, in person's social, recreational, and other day-to-day -day activities. And when that happens, then that is that they become a clinical population. So that is when basically you can help them. And there are people who may have misophonia or hyperacusis, but it doesn't really cause any distress in their life and doesn't really impact on their life. So that does not really classify as somebody that you can actually um, help because this condition is not uh, bothering them. So what is uh, CBT? Uh, CBT is based on the cognitive theory by Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis. And uh, we got the picture of Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis at the top. And um, so the cognitive theory is that uh, the life events that happen to us, they do not directly create our emotional reactions. The reason for our emotional reactions to life events is because of the thought process that goes through our mind about those events. For example, if I tell you something and makes you feel angry, according to cognitive therapy, the reason that you are angry is not what I told you, that's the life event, and the reason that you're angry is because of the thought process, what you think and how you interpret what I told you, and that is what makes you feel angry. And that is the essence of uh, cognitive therapy which were developed by, uh, by these uh, people. And they developed different uh, therapies initially. Uh, Albert Ellis, rational emotive therapy, and, uh, and Aaron Beck, cognitive therapy. But over the years, these therapies have been uh, merged. And this is the uh, Aaron Beck with Joe Biden, and uh, Patrick Kennedy was the former uh, governor of Rhodes Island, uh, who has been a, a mental health advocate uh, for many years. And if you uh, search for cognitive therapy uh, in the last few days, the headlines, uh, unfortunately, BBC News, Dr. Aaron Beck, cognitive behavioral therapy pioneer, dies age 100. So he died a few days ago, 1st of November. And, um, and many news media, CNN, uh, giving tribute to him, um, and this is the Twitter account of Judith Beck, who is the daughter of Aaron Beck, who is also a professor of psychology. And uh, American Psychiatric Association, uh, New York Times, The Independent, uh, The Guardian, so all of the uh, news media and associations relevant to uh, psychology giving their tribute to Aaron Beck, who was a true influential uh, figure in, uh, in the field of modern uh, psychology. I also give my uh, tribute to him as I have uh, learned significantly from uh, his books and his methods and I use those for my patients with tinnitus. And um, so 
bit of a sad uh, news, but he had a very uh, happy life and his uh, legacy is continued by uh, hundreds of thousands of therapies uh, all over the world. So cognitive behavior therapy in terms of the uh, tinnitus rehabilitation has been on the uh, agenda for some years. In 2014, the American ENT Association uh, gathered a group of um, uh, professionals from many different medical disciplines, from audiology, uh, ENT, neurology, psychiatry, uh, even dentists uh, and other uh, relevant um, uh, medical disciplines, and they basically reviewed all of the research evidence to come up with a clinical guideline uh, for tinnitus uh, management. And in that guideline, cognitive behavioral therapy was one of the interventions that they did recommend to actually uh, use for management of tinnitus. More recently, there has been uh, this uh, Cochrane uh, systematic review, which has been done by a group of uh, renowned um, researchers um, in the field of um, tinnitus. And uh, they, uh, in, in Cochrane reviews, they basically look at um, randomized controlled trials which is the gold standard for any kind of intervention. And so there has been many randomized controlled trials for the effect of CBT on tinnitus, and, but the quality of these trials is, are different. And so this group of people, they basically look into each one of those randomized controlled trials and assess them uh, in order to see how robust the methodology is. So for each of the papers that they review, they assess the risk uh, for bias uh, in different uh, parts of that paper. And so each paper will get sort of a score in terms of how much risk of bias they have. And the more risk of bias, then in their analysis that they will do, this paper will have less effect in the final outcome when they pull all of these studies uh, together. And uh, this is an example of um, what they... they uh, so these are different papers uh, that have been published, and these are the weightings. So the higher the weightings means that the study had less risk of bias. And uh, so this is about uh, uh, CBT versus no intervention or a waiting list group and the impact of it on quality of life related to tinnitus. And uh, majority of the st studies, they have their results which were favored uh, CBT and uh, the final outcome favored CBT as well. This is another one that they did, uh, CBT versus audiological care. And in the audiological care was tinnitus education and rehabilitation for hearing loss. They got three studies, and then again the pooled uh, meta-analysis favored CBT. Another outcome, CBT versus um, experimental control groups, other things like relaxation therapy, so on and so forth and uh, the impact on tinnitus on quality of life. Again, the pooled uh, outcome, con taking into consideration the methodological qualities of those studies, favored uh, CBT. And uh, another one, CBT versus no intervention, and the outcome was anxiety at the end of the treatment, uh, favored CBT. Uh, CBT versus no intervention, uh, outcome on depression at the end of the treatment, and this uh, also favored uh, CBT uh, compared to um, people who were waiting. We, so the research evidence for um, effectiveness of CBT in reducing tinnitus distress is quite robust. And uh, none of those studies actually said that CBT reduces the tinnitus, and, uh, and that's not even the aim of the therapy. The aim is to help the person to not to be affected, not to be distressed by their tinnitus. And uh, CBT has shown that it can achieve that. Uh, with regard to hyperacusis, there are not really many uh, studies in a form of randomized controlled trial um, that has been done. Uh, uh, I, with a, with a clinical psychology colleague, wrote this paper that we discuss how CBT can be done uh, for, uh, for hyperacusis. There is one 
um, a randomized controlled trial for CBT for hyperacusis by Uris and her colleagues. And, uh, in, and this is the only randomized control trial for CBT for hyperacusis. And uh, in this study, um, they grouped people to two groups. One group received CBT, one group did not receive CBT, waited, and then later on they also received CBT. And uh, so they measured uncomfortable loudness levels as a, a measure for their hyperacusis. And, um, and these were their uh, results. So they... Um, So the group that uh, received CBT, uh, their, their uncomfortable loudness levels improved, waiting list did not improve, and when waiting list also received CBT, they also uh, improved, and they reported it uh, separately uh, in two years. Uh, for misophonia, um, the recognition for misophonia as a medical condition um, is much more uh, younger, if you like, than hyperacusis, and but because it has attracted uh, attention of uh, neurologists and psychiatrists, so the progress on it has been a bit faster than um, than hyperacusis. So there are a couple of randomized controlled trials on um, CBT for misophonia, and uh, which both of them are done with um, a group. In, in Amsterdam is a center of excellence for uh, misophonia. It's a psychiatric uh, center specialized in OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And now they have modified their CBT methodology to actually help people with misophonia as well. And uh, this is their, uh, one of their uh, studies. This is the, the study that they have uh, completed. And um, so they again had uh, people who they uh, separated in two groups. One group received CBT, one group waited, and then after a while they also gave CBT to the group that were uh, waited, and then uh, they compared uh, the result, and this is the result. So this, uh, the, the, the red ones are the CBT group, and, uh, and the blue one is the waiting list. So the ones with the CBT, they quickly improved in terms of the misophonia. They used the measure uh, that they created themselves, this Amsterdam misophonia uh, scale. And uh, so with CBT, the, the scores on that questionnaire improved after three months, and the people in the waiting list, it didn't improve because they were not receiving anything. And then they'll give them also CBT, and suddenly a sharp improvement, almost better <laughs> than, uh, than the people who receive CBT uh, more quickly. And then but both treatments, after uh, one year, uh, pretty much uh, both groups uh, achieved uh, good results in terms of improvements in the way uh, that they were dealing with their uh, misophonia. And this is basically your uh, research evidence for uh, misophonia and hyperacusis. As I said, there are not a huge amount of studies. This is basically it for hyperacusis and misophonia in terms of CBT, but for tinnitus, um, there are many which have been reviewed in, in that Cochrane uh, review. So there are certainly uh, more need for research studies uh, for hyperacusis and misophonia in terms of uh, CBT. This is a paper that uh, I wrote with uh, several of my uh, colleagues, which basically reviews all of the research evidence, including the Cochrane reviews, because there are several of them, and it's an open access uh, paper. So if you wanted to get some sort of a, a summary of where is the research evidence on CBT for these three conditions, um, you can uh, read this. So now uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the technical aspects of CBT. I hope you're ready for it. It's not too early on uh, this. Um, I understand that you know, it's a mixed uh, audience here. So some of you are audiologists more uh, and, and scientists more to do working with technical aspects of the audiology, and some of you hearing therapists and maybe psychologists more familiar with these uh, concepts. So I try to uh, discuss it in a way that everybody can uh, benefit from it. So in CBT, 
it is very important to try to conceptualize what is the distress and the mechanism in which the distress is produced in the person. So the distress is the key thing here. So tinnitus is not the key um, thing here because CBT is not going to do anything to the tinnitus. So why the person has tinnitus doesn't really matter when they get to the CBT sessions. But why they are distressed by their tinnitus, that matters, because that is what CBT can help them with. So this is now you pass the diagnostic stages, you get to this place that you want to help this person to cope better with their tinnitus. And um, so in CBT you, use, you explain the distress caused by tinnitus using models. And this is a model that we created over the years and that can describe <coughs> the, 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 how uh, CBT can create distress, uh, how, uh, I'm sorry, how tinnitus can create distress and CBT, hopefully to remove that distress. This model was not looking like this uh, 10 years ago. So this has uh, evolved over the years to get to this point that I'm presenting it uh, this morning for you. So the model starts with uh, tinnitus, which is the trigger. So all we say there is that tinnitus is triggering this cycle. But what is the cycle? So it has different components. So tinnitus first triggers an initial reaction in the person. And this initial reaction has different components. Um, like the emotions that they experience, uh, the bodily sensations that they have, and uh, also the behavior that they may, have, they may be having. So this is their initial reaction when they, when they become conscious of their tinnitus. Of course, when you ask your patients, when do you hear your tinnitus, they may be hearing their tinnitus all the time, but they may not be aware of it all the time. So there are times that they'll forget about it, and then suddenly they start hearing it. In that moment, they will have this initial reaction, which has those different components. Then there are a chain of thoughts that goes through their mind uh, about their tinnitus or the impact of it uh, on them. And some examples, I cannot sleep because of it. Uh, it's an effort for me. Tinnitus makes my life miserable and sad. I will be snappy at people. Uh, it distracts me uh, from my work. Uh, I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life, so on and so forth. And uh, then these thoughts will lead to a follow-on reaction, which the follow-on reaction also have the um, behavioral, emotional, and bodily sensation components to it. And then they have further uh, negative and evaluative uh, thoughts, usually deeper thoughts, the meaning behind the original ones, like I cannot cope with this, I'm not good enough, I'm failing, my life is pointless, uh, I'm less of a person that I used to be, and these thoughts will basically feed back to the reactions, creating this vicious uh, cycle of anxiety whenever they are aware of their tinnitus. And uh, the aim, and, and when this cycle is present, will also, because all of the um, arrows here are cross-connected, so when the cycle is present, they also have more attention uh, and more perception of the tinnitus. The more get, they get annoyed, uh, the more they hear their tinnitus. And CBT aims to break this um, cycle and uh, by helping them to understand the, the, the cycle first and uh, working on two aspects of it, cognitive behavioral. So CBT helps them to um, understand what are the thought process that goes through their mind and also the behaviors that uh, they do and help them to modify these. Obviously, if they don't want to, to change any of these. Nobody can make them to, so they need to be motivated uh, to do CBT. But if they want to, um, to, uh, to learn this and do this, changing our thoughts and, uh, and behaviors are not easy, but it is doable. And CBT can teach them techniques and methods to actually do that in a very systematic and effective uh, way. And this was, in fact, one of the uh, main uh, points that Aaron Beck made in, uh, in the 70s 
that uh, CBT is based on the skills that people actually have. So we can change our mind. We do that all the time. We can learn, and when you, whenever you learn a new thing, your thought process changes, and we can change our behaviors. So, and he contrasted CBT, which is something that is uh, based on the skills that that people have. You have to basically help them to recruit that and target it at dealing with their anxiety compared to other approaches which were at the time like psychoanalysis which uh, were skills that you had to have a therapist to help you to actually explore those unconscious uh, thoughts and help them to, to change them. So this was a more a common sense approach when Aaron Beck uh, introduced it. So I don't go to any further detail because I have three models, uh, one of them for tinnitus, hyperacusia, misophonia. So I try to add more information as I talk about the other uh, models. All of the models, the framework of them, are, uh, are similar. So this is the hyperacusis model. So this time the trigger are the external sounds. So the person who have hyperacusis, when they uh, hear um, the loud noises, they have this initial reaction. So what, would, what are the things which can be in that initial reaction? Um, the, in terms of the emotion, they may feel, what, what do you think they can feel? If somebody who has hyperacusis, they hear a loud noise, what would it make them feel? What's the emotion that they could experience? Anger. They can feel angry. And what else? Scared. They can feel scared as well. And uh, what, what is the immediate emotion that they may have? You, because you know, for, for you to become angry, you need to have some sort of thoughts in your mind, uh, blaming something, so you get angry. So usually anger uh, happens uh, as a follow-on reaction, when they start thinking, ah, why this person made this noise, they are ignorant and they know my ears are sensitive. And so those kind of thoughts can create that anger. And um, the emotions that often can be at the initial, it, it can be anger, but usually the, that, that anxiety is very, uh, often comes up as their initial uh, reaction. And then initial behaviors, uh, sometimes they may automatically try to uh, cover the ear, be very for uh, thinking about it. And also the bodily sensation when they hear a loud noise could be pain, so or feeling a distortion in their, their hearing. And uh, so these are all initial reaction. And then there will be chain of thoughts going through their mind which will lead to their follow-on uh, reaction, which could be uh, getting angry um, at the person who making this noise or or the behavior of avoiding that place, or leave that place, or use earplugs, or so on and so forth, and uh, and the physical sensations related, uh, bodily sensations related to uh, anxiety, and uh, for example, they could have get headaches because of the tension that they are experiencing, and like a tension headache. So there is this initial reaction and the follow-on reaction. The difference between them is like if you're walking down the street and suddenly you get punched in your nose. And um, before you can think of like, who was it that punched you, you immediately have pain. So that's your bodily sensation. And you may have this feeling of shock of, you know, how come this happened? So you feel shocked and that would be your emotion. And your initial uh, behavior could be closing your eyes or uh, screaming, uh, something like that. And then there are a chain of thoughts that goes through your mind that who has done this, are they going to do it again, what do I need to do? And then those thoughts will lead to further uh, the, the follow-on reaction, like feeling angry or scared, uh, and the behavior either run away or want to retaliate and fight back, and uh, the bodily sensation like that adrenaline rush within you and giving you that tension, making you ready for that fight and flight uh, response that you may have. So this is the difference between these two and um, the, the, it, it's quite pronounced, specifically for people with uh, hyperacusis and uh, misophonia, that this initial reaction does not really have to be followed by some conscious 
thoughts. So they can have that initial reaction when they hear a noise. Many of them say, I don't think about the noises. When I hear the noise, it hurts my ear. So there is really no conscious thoughts there. So that's part of their initial reaction. But there are thoughts after that, which lead to a follow-on reaction, and then creating this whole uh, cycle of distress. And as you can see, the pattern of the thoughts are different in people with hyperacusis and, and tinnitus. Like, I cannot control this, uh, in, impacting my, my life, impacts on my relationship, uh, I'd no longer be able to be happy, and then the uh, follow-on thoughts, like I'm not normal, useless, uh, cannot cope. So people with tinnitus also can have these type of thoughts, but it, it really depends on what is it that they're triggering and their personality and their past experiences. So they're all impact on the way that uh, they think. And this is for misophonia. So again, the trigger uh, is the misophonia trigger sounds. So it wouldn't be a loud noise. It would be uh, somebody's breathing noise or chewing or slurping or uh, coughing uh, or sometimes clicking sounds. And uh, the person have that initial uh, reaction of feeling disgusted and um, and then ears and uh, bodily sensations the chain of thoughts often I'm trapped or doing this deliberately to annoy me it's done directly to me I need to react and retaliate they need to know that they have been rude and caused the stress for me I'm letting them get away my rights has been in infringed and powerless, I will never be able to have a normal life. This leads to further follow-on reactions and behaviors, and uh, then further uh, negative thoughts, I am weak, failing, so on and so forth, feeding back to this model, creating this uh, vicious cycle of um, anxiety. And then when the cycle is active, so they actually pay more attention to the noises. And so when the noises, when, they, when we develop a cycle like this for any kind of a stimuli, so that means that the stimuli is very important. Therefore, our brain try to focus and monitor that stimuli and make whatever it, do whatever it can do to make us aware of that stimuli and also make us uncomfortable whenever we hear it or see it because this is the fight and flight response. So we have to be aware of the danger and be uncomfortable around that danger so we can get away or uh, deal with it. So naturally, naturally, we are not able to break this cycle as long as the trigger is present. So if there is a snake in the corner of this room, naturally I feel I developed this cycle for it and it will remain with me for as long as the snake is there. So that, that will prompt me to go and deal with that or ask for help. So once the snake is gone, then the cycle also disappears. So this is the natural process of it. So the cycle is not supposed to be, get broken in presence of the danger. It needs to go on, make you uncomfortable, make you aware of the danger for as long as the danger is present. That's the natural part of it. So in CBT, we want to do the unnatural thing. Because we are not going to get rid of the trigger, whether it is tinnitus or noises. We want the person to break this cycle in presence of the trigger. Okay, so, some, some, so they need to gain skills which do not naturally come to them. And that is, makes it difficult. So they have to learn to break this cycle in presence of whatever triggered the cycle at the first place. And um, so, so CBT is a skill that does not naturally come to us. And, but there are so many things that do not naturally come to us. Playing the piano doesn't naturally come to us, or swimming doesn't naturally come to us. We need to learn the theory, take the lessons, practice, and then we can do it. So same with the CBT. It doesn't naturally come to us, and we are not supposed to be able to do that, and, but we can learn it and... Uh, and uh, practice it and implement it. Well, it's not an easy thing to do, so, there are, so as playing the piano. And uh, so that is why it takes uh, a lot of effort from the patient 
to actually learn these techniques. CBT usually takes between uh, 6 to 20 sessions, and these are usually weekly sessions. So you see the patients for uh, once a week for either 6 weeks or 14 weeks or 20 weeks, depending on what is your service and uh, the needs of your uh, patient. And um, so it's an intensive program. And uh, one time I had a patient, uh, she was a journalist, and um, she did the, the, the therapy. <laughs> and because she was a journalist and was writing very well, so her writing was fantastic. So I asked her, can she write a, like a, pa a paragraph, a feedback for my clinic? And, um, and then she wrote this nice feedback, but then she said that this therapy is, uh, is very difficult. It's not for the faint-hearted. So <laughs> I was not sure if that was <laughs> something encouraging other people. It's not for the faint-hearted. And uh, I, I myself tell the people that it is not easy to do CBT. It's a bumpy road ahead. So you've got to fasten your seatbelt when you want to actually get into this uh, program. So there are uh, different tasks in each session. Some of the tasks are uh, focusing on cognitions, helping the person to explore the thought process that goes through their mind and uh, educate them about what are the distortions in our thinking and how they can basically modify the thought process that they have. Some of these thought processes are uh, automatic thoughts at the surface of our uh, uh, cognitive uh, platform, and some of them are deeper uh, thoughts within us, uh, which all of those needs to be explored and the person can uh, modify them. And there are certain behavioral uh, elements to this, which are what, done by the experiments that they do, that they need to basically expose themselves to the problems that they are experiencing, to their fears, so they can improve their tolerance to the uncomfortable emotions that tinnitus or noise can cause on one hand, and on the other hand, test some of their assumptions that they will not be able, for example, to uh, do such and such if they are not uh, avoiding uh, a scenario. So examples of the uh, a, a program of CBT. This is the uh, CBT for six sessions, which is really the minimum that you can uh, deliver is in the first session you explore uh, what is the distress linked to tinnitus and hyperacusis and uh, you need to be able to distinguish the distress that they are experiencing whether it is because of tinnitus or hyperacusis or they are just distressed because of an underlying psychological uh, disorder and at the same time have tinnitus and hyperacusis so it is very important to see whether tinnitus or hyperacusis is the source of their distress, in which case you can help them. But if the distress that they are experiencing is because of something else, perhaps they have OCD or a panic disorder, then you would need to refer them to a person who uh, is specialized uh, for helping them uh, with, with other things. So that's a, a critical part in the usually first session of the CBT. If you decide they, their tinnitus is causing the distress, then you need to create that formulation. So for each patient, uh, this model is created individually for them. So you basically write down what are the initial reaction, what is their follow-on, what are the thought process. So you need to create this model and then make the, um, educate them about CBT and what, what the way forward with it, which is about breaking this cycle. It's not about doing anything to the noise or to their tinnitus. And there are diaries that uh, they need to fill uh, between the sessions, which can uh, help them to identify what are the thought process that they have, how, how is their mood when they are hearing their tinnitus, and they bring this to the session, and then you review them and analyze it uh, for them, and um, so you can uh, help them to, to modify their thought process, and as I said, experiments that they uh, need to do, so the sessions are focusing on these, and uh, different techniques uh, are used for the purpose of identifying thoughts and the experiments at each session. And there are a lot of uh, motiva motivating that you also uh, need um, to do because majority of the patients, when they come to the clinic, they are not coming for CBT. They want to get rid of their tinnitus. So the, the minute one when they walk into the clinic, there is a very gap, big gap, between what they actually want and what you can 
offer with CBT. So you have to basically use uh, motivational uh, techniques to breach this gap. And they really need to be wanting to do CBT so you can actually deliver it uh, for them. So it is a hard work, even when they want to do CBT, they still need to do a lot of work in terms of learning all those things. If they don't want to do it, then it's impossible. So that's the wanting part is uh, very important. So I'd like to uh, share with you uh, a study that we did in terms of uh, in the uh, National Health Service, which we were offering therapy for free. And, uh, but it's not really free, they already paid in taxes, but um, they don't have to pay at the, at the point of the service. And um, so we wanted to, so in this study we look at, the, uh, at what happens with the patients, like when they got referred to us, how many of them we think are suitable for CBT, how many of them we offer them CBT, from the ones that we offer them CBT, how many of them accept it, how many of them say no, that's no good. And, uh, and then basically how many of them finish the full course. And then what are the differences between different groups uh, in this uh, study we looked at. So um, in this cohort, about 266 people attended the initial assessment, which we did their audiological evaluations and they completed a range of questionnaires. And based on that, we decided that 85 of them they did not need any further sessions, they only needed this brief education and they basically wanted to check that everything is okay and they were not too much worried about their tinnitus. So these people were discharged after that initial assessment uh, and um, 181 people uh, attended their first CBT session. So in that first CBT session, that's when you basically interview them in order to understand uh, if they have distress and whether the distress they're experiencing is linked to their tinnitus, or it is because of something else. And if it is because of something else, then they wouldn't be enrolling in a CBT for tinnitus. If the distress that they're experiencing is because of their tinnitus, then they will be enrolling in a tinnitus uh, CBT program. And um, so 124 people, we offered them CBT. We said, yes, we think your CBT, your tinnitus, is causing the distress, and uh, 57 of them uh, we discharged. We either said that the uh, majority of them, the distress that they were experiencing was linked to other problems, maybe the hearing um, loss. So the CBT was not um, something that we wanted to do for hearing loss. They needed to get hearing aids, or the balance problem, or uh, if they were depressed, or some other problems, and the tinnitus was not the source of the problems that they were experiencing. So these people were discharged from our service, but referred to other services. And uh, so the people that we, we thought CBT can help them, and we offered it to them, 68 of them, they said, okay, we do it. And 56 of them, they said, no, thank you very much. I'll just get on with it myself. Yeah? So, and so I'm not going to come here for six weekly sessions. And, uh, but 68 of them said, yes, I do come for that. And from the 68 people who enrolled in the treatment, 46 of them completed the, the therapy, and 22 of them dropped out at various uh, stages. And uh, so now, this was important to us to know, okay, what are the differences between people who pass dropout or people who will decline, so we can predict all of these things at the assessment, so we can become more efficient in, in, in what we, uh, we do. So we, we compared the uh, questionnaire results and audiological results between these uh, different groups. So first of all, the people who we did the assessment for them, and we said, okay, you do not need nothing, so, and we discharged them right away. So they, they, um, the Puritan average of the better ear, ULL mean is the uncomfortable loudness level in the ear, which has the lowest level of ULLs, and uh, tinnitus handicap inventory score, hyperacusis questionnaire, and visual analog scale, so asking the person on a scale from 0 to 10 how loud 
your tinnitus is, 10 is the loudest. So visual analog scale uh, for tinnitus loudness, for annoyance and effect on the life. So these were the measures that we used. And uh, so the group that we discharged, the, those measures were significantly lower than the group that we, we offered them first CBT session. This is not a big surprise because we actually used a lot of these questionnaires to make our first decision that whether this person needs to come for the first CBT session or not. So these are basically people at the top here. So everyone we assessed, those who we discharged, their scores on the questionnaires and everything were much lower than people who we said uh, do come for the first uh, CBT session. Now the next one is the, the trickier one. The people that we interviewed, did, we didn't use any questionnaires there. The questionnaires are out now. So everyone according to questionnaires needed to be here at the first CBT session. But now we interviewed them to find out whether the distress that they were experiencing was because of tinnitus or something else. So were there a difference in the questionnaires or audiological factors between these uh, two groups? And this is the graph for that. So people who were discharged after the first CBT session and people who offered the full treatment. So we looked at all of those variables and as you can see, none of, the, of those measures were significantly different between these two groups. So there was no way to predict who actually uh, uh, is experiencing distress because of their tinnitus, not because of something else, by looking at the questionnaires and the audiological tests. So you had to have that in-depth interview with them in order to understand that. Next are people who we offered CBT to them. We thought that they need CBT, and uh, some of them said yes, some of them said no, thank you very much. And so these are the people who enrolled and people who declined. And um, so what were the differences? So people who enrolled were uh, younger than those who declined, and also the PTA of the better year was better in those who enrolled in the therapy compared to those who declined. And uh, visual analog scale for tinnitus annoyance was also higher in, in people who accepted to enroll and those who declined. So the, but the other questionnaires were not different. So this one is not uh, hard to interpret. So those who had more annoying tinnitus wanted to do the therapy. So that makes sense. And uh, people with regard to better hearing uh, com uh, accepted the therapy more than people from, uh, with, with some hearing loss. The, the way that I look at that is that perhaps those with uh, um, more hearing loss also had hearing aid at least something for their tinnitus which perhaps was helping them and they didn't feel a need for uh, CBT, that's my speculation. And why the people who were a bit older um, not uh, accepting as opposed to the younger ones, perhaps because the older ones had, are among the ones with the higher uh, hearing thresholds, or maybe the same sort of principle applies for this. Uh, but apart from that, we actually haven't collected the data on why they, why they declined. So it's something uh, of interest for future, uh, for people who want to do research. And then people who completed the full course and people who dropped out, also there were no significant difference in any of the measures. So we couldn't, be, we couldn't predict uh, which one of those uh, patients will drop out at the end of the treatment and which one will complete based on their uh, questionnaires. So I thought that I'd share this with you to get an overall view of, from all of those patients who come to the clinic what is the proportion of people who actually need a therapy like this? And what are the proportion that you usually complete? And this was a free NHS service. It, it can be a bit different when you are, uh, it is a paid service, like if they are paying for their sessions uh, upfront or something like that, then the dropout rate may be different. So this was a free NHS uh, service. There is another uh, study which my colleague Brian Moore and, and myself done about the effectiveness of audiologist delivered CBT. This time we looked at uh, the score uh, of the questionnaires before and after treatment. So the, fir um, the, uh, the, the first 
uh, table shows the uh, only people who completed um, the therapy. This is a different cohort uh, of, uh, of patients. So tinnitus handicap inventory, visual analog scale for loudness, annoyance, and impact, hyperacusis and insomnia scores. These were the pre-treatment scores and then post-treatment scores, and all of them significantly improved. Uh, after uh, CBT, and then we did a more complicated analysis called intention to treat analysis. So people who dropped out, we also included them to the analysis. We just used the same score. We assumed that they did not improve. So we used the same score as their pre-treatment for the post-treatment. So this, using this technique, it will basically reduce the effect size of your uh, treatment. But even in the intention to treat analysis, all of the measures improved significantly uh, after uh, CBT. This was not a, a randomized controlled trial. It was just a reflection on this particular version of CBT that we were doing. Obviously, there were already a lot of randomized controlled trials on CBT for tinnitus, which I uh, mentioned earlier. But the most important thing for us was, what do patients think about CBT? So these are patients who come to an audiology clinic, initially an ENT clinic. And uh, in our center, ENT and audiology, we are on the same uh, department. So they come for the ENT, they see an ENT consultant for an ear-related problem. So as far as the patient is concerned, they have something wrong with the ears. That's why they are in the ENT and audiology department. And then they will be referred to audiologists in the same department who are doing a psychological intervention, which is CBT, which is often done by mental health professionals. So we were not sure that whether what we were doing was actually acceptable to the patients who have tinnitus. So we did this study, we asked them, that uh, was it acceptable to you <laughs> that, uh, that this was happening? And uh, before I share the result of the acceptability of it, so again, in, this is again a different cohort of patients. Uh, we use the same questionnaire, plus we use the GAD7 and PHQ9, which are anxiety and depression questionnaires. These scores also significantly improved after uh, CBT for their tinnitus and hyperacusis. So these were the questions. So the patient, we asked them, how effective do you think the CBT was on a scale from 0 to 10? 10 is the highest effectiveness. Or how acceptable do you think it was for you to receive CBT from audiologists as opposed to psychologists in an audiology clinic for your tinnitus? And um, so, the, so for this question, 90% of the patients rated the effectiveness as 7 or above which was uh, very good. And the second question, which was basically the, uh, the second question is, are you able to manage your tinnitus differently compared to before tinnitus uh, therapy? 87% rated it as uh, seven or above. And the final question, the most important one from our view, how acceptable was it for you? 97% of the patients rated that uh, acceptability as seven uh, or more. And uh, so this was very reassuring for us that what we were actually doing was acceptable to the patients receiving uh, the therapy. So I can present more um, data uh, for you, and, uh, but I'd like to um, instead <laughs> um, read uh, um, a passage from uh, The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Grown-ups like numbers. When you tell them about new friend, they never ask questions about what really matters. They never ask what does his voice sound like? What games does he like best? Uh, does he collect butterflies? They ask how old is he? How many brothers does he have? How much does he weigh? How much money does, does he have? And only then uh, do they think that they know him. And uh, if you tell grown-ups, I saw a beautiful red break a uh, red brick house with uh, geraniums at the windows and doves at the roof. Uh, they won't be able to imagine such a house. You have to tell them, I saw a house worth a thousand francs, euros, <laughs> and then they exclaim, what a pretty house. So I want to my next slide, instead of presenting numbers, to talk, talk about the experience of a patient. 
So one of the patients that they completed the CBT for tinnitus, we asked them to write something, and this is what they wrote. I think tinnitus is a very specific condition that is very difficult to appreciate if you have not experienced it or are not an expert in audiology. It is a condition that is with you all the time, at work or at rest. It is inside your own head and feels inescapable. It is not an outside problem or an external issue to be resolved. And to have someone understand that and combine it with the knowledge of hearing, hearing loss and hyperacusis is extremely important. I have had more general CBT for other issues in the past and I think the targeted CBT approach in the audiology department made the CBT treatment as useful as, and relevant as it could be. And uh, I thought that this was uh, very uh, encouraging. And in all of the surveys that we were asking them, okay, so what we, can, what we can do to make this better, usually one of the answers was more sessions. <laughs> so that's why the six sessions that these people are receiving is the really the bare uh, minimum. And uh, so I like to talk a little bit about uh, the training for CBT. Obviously, this is a different skill set than what audiologists or even hearing therapists achieve. And um, there are now, uh, re last year, this book been uh, published by uh, Elder Buick and Gerhard Anderson, Vinaya Manchaha and uh, Victor Kaldu. And so a CBT for tinnitus by plural. So it's a very uh, good book that you can use to learn about uh, CBT. Uh, and also uh, Brian Moore and I uh, are almost uh, done with writing this and will be published next year with Oxford University Press, a step-by-step -step guide to cognitive behavior therapy for tinnitus. This is a, a book for clinicians, that book for you, to, if you wanted to learn how to do CBT for tinnitus, this can be a resource. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we, we have written a book, Living Well with Tinnitus, a 10-step self-help guide using cognitive behavioral therapy. This will be also uh, out next year, and this is a book for patients. So the patients who want to do CBT, this can be used as their uh, resource, if you like, um, to enhance their learning, helping them in that bumpy road of uh, CBT. And uh, this is again Aaron Beck and Judith Beck, and uh, they have this institute, and uh, that Judith is the head of the Institute of Beck Institute of Cognitive Therapy. They have a lot of different uh, courses for cognitive therapy, CBT for depression and suicide, uh, CBT for anxiety, so on and so forth. So these are the main courses that psychologists and mental health professionals attend. And, but they also have uh, courses like CBT for chronic pain and medical conditions. And in courses like this, uh, is not uh, only for psychologists, it's for the, uh, designed for health and mental health professionals. So you would be the health professionals that can benefit uh, from uh, these courses, or for example, a course of CBT for weight loss and maintenance. This is a course that uh, is likely to attract a lot of dietitians uh, instead of psychologists uh, to it. So CBT can be, you can learn CBT if you wanted to, um, so it is not only dedicated to one uh, professional. So uh, also Oxford University has a hub for uh, CBT um, they have many professors and experts on CBT and they do a lot of research so they also do workshops and their workshops are suitable for mental health professionals from any discipline and they have been successfully around uh, the country for nurses, doctors, trainee psychologists, occupational therapists, social workers and counsellors. So people with wide range of disciplines can actually learn CBT and apply that in their own uh, clinics uh, for their particular issue that they are dealing with. In your case, it would be for tinnitus and hyperacusis. And this is also my own uh, course, which I'm doing it uh, online uh, and uh, at the moment so is a 12-month course focusing on uh, CBT for uh, tinnitus and hyperacusis and uh, misophonia. And uh, when you do CBT, you also uh, need to uh, benefit from supervision. So you talk to people who can supervise you and share your patients. So we formed a group of 
supervisors from different backgrounds, ENT, psychology, audiology, uh, which all of these are on my uh, website that you can look. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, share with you the uh, some slides about ICBT or Internet uh, CBT. And during there has been a lot of research studies uh, about the effectiveness of Internet CBT for uh, tinnitus, and uh, and this has become more important during the lockdown. And so uh, people may not be able to have access to uh, a therapist, so internet CBT was more uh, used, and um, so this is an alternative to, to the real CBT, <laughs> so the inter CBT, internet CBT. And this is, there, there has been a lot of research for other uh, problems as well, like depression, anxiety, so on and so forth. The internet CBT is now uh, used as a first point of call for many problems, and then if they are not benefiting from it, then they escalate it to seeing a, a therapist and doing the more individualized uh, CBT. So I have developed this uh, internet CBT uh, program which is based on that six sessions of CBT that I just uh, explained uh, for you and uh, so basically patients uh, get an activation code uh, from their therapist and then they can go and do the modules, the six sessions on their own without you having to uh, to help them. Obviously this will be less costly for them as opposed to they, they were going to uh, see you and uh, people who will uh, who will provide this internet CBT their uh, their details will go into the website and patients can find them uh, directly and uh, and come to their clinics. This is something that any of you with uh, audiology and hearing therapy background uh, can uh, can 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 do in terms of prescribing. And we, I did a quick survey with this and asking 41 healthcare professionals who attended the workshop uh, for internet CBT, uh, asked them to, uh, two questions. How likely uh, are you to use this ICBT tinnitus program as a complementary intervention to the services that you provide to your tinnitus patients? And then the second question was, how likely is it for you to use this as a standalone intervention? like either just, just to give this to them as a in, in standalone intervention, or you do the interventions that you do, perhaps you are not doing CBT, you're doing sound therapy and counseling and education, and then you also give this to them as a uh, complementary uh, CBT intervention. And um, this was the results that I got for the first question, which was uh, as a standalone uh, intervention. So this, the red one is the likely that I give that, and blue is the extremely likely. So these were the amount of the people who said it's likely or extremely likely to give this as a standalone intervention, but these are the amount of people who said that they basically can give this as a complementary uh, to the interventions that uh, they do. And uh, it didn't really uh, matter uh, their um, didn't matter what was their professional background, whether they were psychologists or audiologists, there was really no difference in the way that they uh, responded uh, to that question. So, the conclusions. So CBT is an evidence-based uh, intervention which can be used to help people to cope with the tinnitus, and um, not easy for the patient, it's not easy for you to do it. You need training to actually be able to do this, but if you decide to get this training, the training is available uh, to you. And uh, for hyperacusis and misophonia, uh, also CBT, in terms of my own clinical experience, it can help them, but in terms of the research findings, we only have two. One randomized control trial for hyperacusis and one for uh, misophonia. And uh, so we need more research evidence with regard to those uh, two conditions and CBT. From patients' perspective, CBT delivered by audiologists focused on tinnitus and hyperacusis management is effective and acceptable. 
and uh, training for tinnitus is open to audiologists and other qualified health and social care professionals who want to extend this their scope of practice to support patients with tinnitus and hyperacusis. An internet CBT can be used as a complementary intervention to the services that you provide for the tinnitus patients. So thank you very much for listening, and so I think we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, inspiring talk about uh, how to help people living well with uh, tinnitus. Uh, I think we will have some questions, and I have gotten a couple of questions uh, the, via the app, but it's also possible to get hold on this one if you want to ask a question live here in the audience. You will bring this around, but while we're waiting for hands to race. Uh, I will uh, read some questions from the app. And the first one is uh, if it is effective or contraproductive to, for, for tinnitus hyperacusis treatment outcome to combine CBT with sound generators or hearing aids. Is it effective or contraproductive? Well, it's, uh, it really depends because you know, uh, sometimes it's some of the behaviors that we do, even if they are uh, good and healthy behaviors that they can be um, we can we, we do them as an avoidance behavior or a ritual for example if somebody who uh, have tinnitus and uh, want to stop smoking because their tinnitus get better or stop drinking alcohol or start exercising do all of those healthy things because they want to make some changes in their tinnitus all of those healthy behaviors become like a ritual uh, for them and uh, and rituals usually in short term can help them to feel okay I'm doing something good uh, to help them feel better more in control but almost always they backfire in the long term so even very healthy behaviors like those behaviors if they're doing it to get rid of tinnitus that is counterproductive for their progress with regard to hearing aid if they use hearing aids to help them hear better it's, uh, it's a healthy behavior for them to do. But if they become to this thinking that I use hearing aids to somehow get rid of my tinnitus, that can become a bit counterproductive for their uh, therapy. The same applies if they don't use a hearing aid because they're afraid of it makes my tinnitus worse, that can become uh, counterproductive. So the hearing aid, the use of it or not use of it, can become counterproductive depending on why is it that they do it. They need a hearing aid, it helps them to hear better, but they're afraid that it makes their tinnitus worse. So if they not use a hearing aid in that scenario, that'd be counterproductive. I have one more question from the app, but I can't, I can't see any hands in the audience. So if you want to ask some more questions, you will have to raise your hand and you will get the microphone uh, coming to you. But I have one more here. Uh, since some people declined further therapy after interviews and not uh, after the questionnaires, uh, is it possible that the patients simply had uh, what we ca can call bad chemistry uh, with the interviewer, that they didn't want therapy, uh, a therapy regime that they felt rested too much on a rel uh, relationship with a stranger? Yes, that is possible. And um, so we, they, to, to get this, like, uh, we didn't have a huge uh, number of patients and we had like six different uh, audiologists who were doing these sessions. So it was very hard to see like, is it a particular therapist that they, people don't like? But things like that, you know, you can assess if you had a larger number of patients, but that is certainly a possibility mm. for that. This is dep it very much depends on building that relationship with the patient. Mm. Yeah. And here's the last chance for asking a question or else we have to say thank you to Dr. Hashir Ash. Thank you. Uh, the conference has donated uh, some money to Deaf Aid as, uh, uh, as a thank you for your speech. Uh, and this is a charity organization securing school and education for deaf children in Kenya. And as a token of our appreciation, you will also get some Kenyan coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much.
Og da har det seg sånn, folkens, at uh, i sted så ble jeg utfordret på å stå og prate i uh, noen minutter ekstra. 